yeah, that was a great talk, and hopefully I can get into a little bit of uh, more detail in some of those areas. Um, so, but first I should uh, change the name of the talk because as I was <laughs> researching it, I realized it's just like, it really is a rabbit hole. It's just like nuance on nuance of, um, you know, what's, what's actually going on. Uh, it's uh, much more complicated than you would, might believe if you had just heard some success stories. Um, so first, let's uh, say what we're talking about when we talk about machine bias uh, or algorithm algorithmic bias. It occurs uh, when machine intelligence exhibits bias against groups of people. Usually systematic and unfair bias uh, is what we focus on. Um, and there, you, I've also seen algorithmic fairness, uh, so that's kind of the positive framing of it. Uh, efforts to ensure people are treated equally by algorithms. But that actually, you know, it's, it's kind of a mess of like a bunch of different competing things often uh, because there's no real set of metrics that people are using uh, and in some cases uh, the different definitions of fairness can be conflicting um, and you also might hear about algor algorithmic accountability um, too but first we should uh, differentiate between um, other uses of bias in the field, it's different from bias that you would use uh, uh, with bias invariance as a tool to in improve performance of your model. Uh, that's more like global performance. It doesn't relate to a specific type of group. Um, and let's also talk a bit about human bias because that is a very complicated and far-reaching thing. Uh, it, Pretty much anything about a person can mark them as a member of a group and lead people to hold bias against that person just because of their perceived group membership. Um, it can be really, really subtle uh, and it's just kind of intertwined uh, with, as Carol was talking, intertwined with how our brains work, uh, how we take in knowledge from a mental model of the world. Um, so it pretty much just affects everyone. And yeah, that doesn't always need to be a negative thing. That was a great point from the talk that we just heard. Um, so some of these are actually legally protected classes like race, religion, sex, national origin, et cetera. And those are the kind of classes that mean targets of efforts to avoid machine bias. Um, uh, these aren't the only groups that can experience it, of course, uh, but uh, they are protected by law uh, because of the discrimination they've faced in the past. And that actually, <laughs> we'll, we'll see how that plays into getting bias data based on biases in the world um, uh, later on in the talk. Uh, so, you know, the, the thinking is like, we're all human, nobody expects us to be perfect. Uh, but that brings us to the reason why machine bias is so dangerous. Machines are seen as impartial. Uh, my favorite quote here is, uh, machine learning is like money laundering for bias, and it's so true. Um, they're, they're, I've also heard the term math washing. It's kind of like green washing or pink washing to make your uh, business seem more friendly to the environment or to women when it, you know, that not, might not actually be the case. Like, you know, uh, oil companies are green washing all the time. Uh, so math washing refers to using algorithm or words like algorithm or model to give an appearance of objectivity when actually there's like some real subjectivity at work. Um, so yeah, it's often the case that you can suspect an algorithm is biased, but if it's a pr proprietary system, you can't be sure. One example is uh, PredPol, and in this case, uh, they publish their algorithm. So so researchers were able to see how it behaves. So it's uh, one of the most popular predictive policing algorithms, which is like actually a thing. It's like minority report-ish. Um, based on ideas from an earthquake prediction model, they try and determine where crime is likely to happen so the, that uh, police officers can uh, patrol there. Um, so one concern about fairness was uh, the potential for a feedback loop, like you see here. You observe higher crime rates in an area, and that's observed crime, like not actual crime rates or not something we can really track because we don't hear about all of it. Um, so you observe higher crime rates, then you do additional policing of the area, and then additional observation of crimes in response to the additional police presence, and then that just 
uh, feeds back into further higher observed crime rates, which in turn, you know, will make the model like maybe more sure that this is an area that really has a lot of crime and things can spiral out of control. So uh, what these researchers did was they formed uh, like a synthetic population of all of Oakland and estimated illegal drug use as one type of crime. Um, and that's, you can see that at the bottom there. Uh, so, you know, it's present in a lot of different areas. It actually more or less uh, mirrors the po distribution of population as a whole, you know, among different races. Um, and then at the top there, you can see uh, drug arrest, actual drug arrest data. It's very concentrated in this uh, one neighborhood of West Oakland and along this one uh, street there. Um, so as you can see, like places that are actually getting arrests aren't necessarily like there's not necessarily more crime happening there. Um, so with uh, another thing they did with this study was take the uh, algorithm that PredPol had published and they fed in, uh, they assumed an additional 20% uh, increase in observed crime um, and then sure enough that black bar like goes up and up and up uh, in, in this simulation. Um, so indeed like that algorithm just ends up kind of worsening the problem that's already there. <laughs> um, so police departments may make the case that predictive policing algorithms allow them to better allocate resources, but it actually just shifts accountability away from police. Um, they can't explain their decisions uh, because they deployed police there because the algorithm told them to. So, uh, yeah, this er eroding of accountability is something you see over and over again with algorithms, how they've been used in practice. And another example from criminal justice is risk assessment uh, or trying to determine who's likely t to commit another crime when they come in front of you for, uh, like, as a defendant. Um, so, Compass is probably one of the highest profile cases of machine bias. Um, the initial claims of bias came from ProPublica. They did a report uh, that found uh, that black people who didn't end up reoffending were actually more likely to be assigned high risk scores. You can see the numbers there. Um, it's almost twice the rate, which you know seems super unfair and that holds for low risk people who did end up reoffending. White people were much more likely to get a low risk score who, who didn't uh, did end up reoffending. Um, so, you know, this looks super unfair, right? <laughs> Good. I'm glad you guys agree. <laughs> because um, the makers of Compass North Point actually responded by, uh, to ProPublica's report, first by picking apart technically what they did, but also um, responded by saying that their algorithm is fair because each risk score has roughly the same accuracy for different races. And uh, that's the, the goal of their algorithm. You can see that here. I took the numbers from ProPublica and put them as, in this table here. So, you know, uh, North Point would say 59% and 63% accuracy are pretty close. So it, it's behaving properly. It's, you know, doing roughly the same thing for white people and black people. But, <laughs> you know, it's more complicated than that. Actually, it's like, who's right? Well, they're both, they're both kind of right in their own ways. Um, it's, uh, yeah, there was a, a bunch of papers, uh, academic papers came out, uh, rebuttal, rebuttal from ProPublica, which is worth reading. Um, and it turns out, so they're both correct. The two measures of fairness are conflicting and it's mathematically impossible to sa satisfy both. If you have different base rates of recidivism and note that that's based on observed crime, again, not actual crime. Um, so having, you know, inequality there means it's like impos actually impossible to satisfy both de definitions of fairness. Um, some might say, unfortunately, the definition uh, on the right here is the one that's generally used among criminologists. Um, so, uh, you know, that, yeah, it's, it's, it's really complicated. <laughs> and in order to kind of get a better intuition for how this works, I made uh, a demo uh, web page. Uh, 
Yes, there it is. <laughs> so um, as you can see, oh, hey, uh, I forgot, totally forgot to give you the bit.ly for it. Let me just pop back over. <laughs> um, there we go. Uh, there's the URL. <laughs> uh, if you're interested, I would encourage you to go there. It's bit.ly, bias for all. Um, and yeah, we'll just take a look at this because it, you know, I'm the kind of person like it really helps me understand if I have numbers in front of me. So here uh, we have, um, oh, that's like way too small. <laughs> Let's just zoom in on this here. Uh, these are confusion matrices. Uh, you have uh, failure, um, meaning uh, I think they do commit a crime, and success, meaning yes, <laughs> they don't end up committing another crime. So, you know, you can kind of look at it broken down: uh, false negatives, false positives. Uh, kind of really like have. It really comes down to like how bad is it having a false negative versus a false positive, and people will give you different answers about how bad it is. Like uh, North Point, the makers of Compass would say, like uh, it's much better to to be able to keep somebody from committing a crime, you know, um, by accurately reflecting having their bail, bail reflect that versus uh, you know thinking oh a false. Uh, positive is actually really, really bad because you can end up being more harsh to somebody than is necessary. Well, anyway, uh, so I put in some of the de definitions here. Um, so these equations uh, kind of are, represent the different definitions of fairness. So that first one there, uh, these are the actual numbers. So that first one is um, North Point's definition, the generally accepted definition. Conditional use, accuracy, equality, it's sometimes called, uh, yeah, other things. Um, but that says, like, you get a score of seven. Um, that means the same thing for people, no matter what their race is. Um, uh, and yeah, the second. This row here, that's what uh, ProPublica was complaining about. Um, so if we look at, well, what if we change the numbers to satisfy the, their definition, then all these go green, but the other ones went black, so they're not satisfied anymore. And what it comes down to is uh, the different base rates. It, um, you know, you can kind of, you can move uh, numbers from like laterally, but you can't move them vertically unless you like change actually how many <laughs> arrests there are um, for for different people. Uh, so yeah, it turns out to do this uh, to satisfy all of them, you have to change the base rate and say, you know, like actually, yeah. Uh, so if it's 39% for people, then for, for both populations, then you can satisfy all the def definitions, but you know, some might say that's not realistic unless you uh, to, like are able to fix the fairness issue overall. Um, yeah. Um, so you know, this is not ideal. It's like not good hearing like, oh well, you can't please everybody, um, and it's, so it's like okay, well. You know, it's at least you're eliminating human bias. So, you know, it, there's some trade-off there for perception of unfairness. Um, but you know, it's like at least you're getting something there. It's not like a bunch of random untrained people could do any. Oh, wait, what? <laughs> Actually, it looks like a bunch of random untrained people exactly did do better than Compass as far as. Accuracy. Somebody did a study, and it looks like the average human does like 62.8% accuracy. Compass does about 65.2. Um, and if you pool the responses, uh, you get 67% accuracy. So you know they just got a bunch of people on Mechanical Turk to to look at some minimal information about these people, not seeing their race or anything, but just looking at their priors and stuff. And you know it, it's like. It's kind of frustrating because it looks, 
as far as I can tell, it looks like there's very little effort put towards studying the accuracy of the systems before they're put in place, and if there are studies, they're done by the people who make them. So, you know, they're imposing their uh, thoughts about fairness um, in that process. So, yeah, it's kind of a downer, but we have some solutions. Um, in the second half of the presentation, I, I think it'll be a little bit, a little bit more positive. Uh, so the first thing you might think of is like, well, we can just leave out uh, gender and age because they're protected attributes, and we'll get something fair. But that doesn't end up being the case because they're often highly correlated with other things. Like somebody who mentioned zip code correlates with race. Sadly, you know, we still live in a very segregated society. So, um, sorry, I promised no doom and gloom earlier. Whoops. Um, uh, yeah, so there are actually methods that you can do, use to identify strongly correlated attributes, but still you end up with more weaker correlations that could still influence the outcome. Um, you know, things like gender could be tied to college major. Uh, there's a huge problem in STEM fields. Women are, for a variety of reasons, um, are like social pressure. They're like less likely to major in STEM fields. So if you're looking at, um, you know, uh, uh, job applicants uh, with, with the, the information including college major, you know, you could think that a STEM major is more predictive of aptitude to a STEM job, but that, you know, it's not necessarily true of all populations. For women, it might be less predictive than it is for men. Um, yeah, but so there are actually methods for including protected attributes, and I think that's generally what's done. You include protected at attributes and uh, try and guarantee fairness in other ways, but yeah, it's definitely a field of study. Um, another uh, solution can deal with how you uh, handle unequal distributions of, among populations. Um, so oversampling is one that I've seen used, I think that's uh, yeah, used in applications like political polling. Um, most of those are conducted over landlines, so you get an unequal distribution of population. It skews more towards older people than younger people because fewer younger people have landlines, but you can do things like uh, you know, just repeat a data point. Um, so then you get uh, a distribution that looks more like the population as a whole. That doesn't work great for machine learning because machine learning uh, looks for patterns in data and uh, kind of the more variety of data you have, the, the better. Um, so something like data augmentation is also another technique. You, uh, like for image processing, you can uh, translate, rotate, skew, otherwise transform images um, so to turn your uh, set into like even more um, items. Uh, and yeah, so you can imagine you could do that kind of unequally across uh, underrepresented populations. But you also do want to be careful about this because machine learning is great at picking out patterns and even if data looks random, it, uh, it might not be <laughs> from the machine's perspective. Um, another route is more diverse teams. I know this is like not a panacea like the uh, previous talk uh, dealt with, but you know it's it's still great and it is also good, a good idea for other reasons. Anyway, uh, studies have shown that diverse teams are perform better than homogenous teams. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of other reasons to have diverse teams. Um, and it's important to think not just about gender and racial diversity, but economic uh, diversity and age and educational backgrounds. Um, yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of info, a lot of work being done on this issue, but just a few things from you know, my own personal experience as somebody from an underrepresented group who's had a career in tech. Um, qualified members of other groups may not match the patterns you're used to seeing. Uh, and sourcing diverse candidates is a lot of extra work. Uh, diverse candidates may not be job seeking as much, although there were a lot of job seekers up there. That was cool to see. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's you know it can kind of be a risky thing uh, looking at, for other positions when you're a member of an underrepresented group because uh, you worry extra about culture fit and uh, stuff like that or an inclusive culture. 
Uh, and uh, inclusion is also really important. It's uh, like even more work than sourcing diverse candidates. It's uh, and it's everyone's responsibility, not not just members of underrepresented groups, to to make sure inclusion efforts are successful. Kind of needs to be like a core thing about the company. Anyway, but that's <laughs> you know that's just just one piece of the puzzle. Um, other ways to uncover bias, uh, there's community policing, uh, so you can allow your users to report bias. So, you know, they are generally even more diverse set of people uh, than you can feasibly have on a team. So, uh, yeah, building that into your systems um, is a good idea. And then uh, algorithmic auditing is another important tool. So you can analyze performance on different inputs. Um, and it, actually, a team from uh, CMU uh, did this. And they found stuff like uh, women were, sh were shown less high-paying jobs. Men saw equivalent men saw jobs, high-paying jobs, six times more frequently than uh, equivalent women. Um, you know, so, yeah, and that's, uh, yeah. Uh, also, ask for help. Uh, Algorith Al <laughs> Algorithmic Justice League uh, came out of uh, MIT Media Lab, and they offer, actually offer to help you detect bias. They do a lot of things other than that, but that's one thing they do. And there's a consulting firm, uh, Weapons and Math Destruction, was the book uh, from the previous talk. Uh, that was up there. Uh, and the author of that actually started a consulting firm that helps people detect bias uh, in their companies. Um, yeah, another important thing is interpretability. Uh, if you read right to left, um, this is like how many layers, so like how complex uh, models were for this uh, competition. Um, and, you know, things are just like really growing in the complexity of, uh, you know, deep neural nets um, as we get more data and more computing power. Uh, so they're, like, beyond the limits of human cognition now. You can no longer, you know, it's not just, like, this hand-written, tweaked algorithm uh, anymore. It's, like, impossible, kind of, to, to understand what's really going on, even if you sit and look at it for a while. So, uh, you know, that's... <laughs> That, that hurts accountability, um, giving over decision-making to, to things that you don't even know how they work. Uh, but luckily, interpretability has a lot of other benefits, so a lot of people are working on it. Um, it allows you to take insights from machine learning back into the field, um, and it can also help identify errors, like another speaker was talking about um, the algorithm that learned that asthma patients were more likely to serve pneumonia, but that was only because they got rushed to the ICU. Um, so, you know, it's uh, really important to be able to see those weaknesses in your data. Um, and yeah, so finally, I have a success story uh, that has to do with word beddings. Uh, there's a method of debiasing them that I think is very satisfying. <laughs> so uh, first, I wanted to talk tell you about what word embeddings are. Um, so they're used in modern machine translation and other NLP applications. They're kind of like the building blocks, uh, if you will. They're how we represent words and, and feed it into the systems. Um, so they're huge multidimensional vectors. And the way that you learn them is kind of look at context. So you can see uh, you know, apple juice, orange juice, grapefruit juice, uh, things that are used similarly end up kind of near each other in space. Um, and they even do things like uh, analogies, which is really cool. So they can solve problems like uh, mother is to father as king is to queen. Did I get that wrong? I think I got that wrong. <laughs> anyway, uh, m so mother minus father plus king equals queen. Like if you do the vector math, that actually works out. Um, it's a really cool property of them. Uh, but huh, I wonder what would happen if uh, we try something that's not <laughs> gendered, like doctor. Like wh what do you think? Oh, yeah, it's nurse. So 
even though by definition these, there's nothing about these words that's gendered because usage and usage they're gendered, so the corpus that you used to make these word embeddings, if there are biases in that, then they totally carry over here and that is not desirable. Uh, one example of what this can look like in the real world is uh, Google Translate, <laughs> actually. Um, if Turkish, I guess, has a general neutral pronouns here, and if you translate them, they uh, say, he is a doctor, she is a nurse, she is married, he is single. So those are pronouns that just came from uh, Google Translate's model. Um, so I, I don't know if they talked about why this is when this came out, but... Uh, a biased word embedding would totally be something that could lead to this. Um, so I have another demo. If you're on mobile, I don't recommend it because it did not work for me when I tried on my iPhone. Uh, but maybe if you're feeling lucky, um, it's back there. Uh, it's the second thing on the page. Uh, so let's like take a look. Uh, yeah, here we go. So. Uh, I just uh, used, uh, there's this measure called cosine similarity, which helps you see how similar words are uh, to each other in, in these word embeddings. Uh, and you can put in words like power is very masculinized, and this is a fun one as a parent, diaper is very feminized. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's really, it's kind of messed up that this is the case because these things sh shouldn't, be, uh, shouldn't be carried into uh, the things that we're building in, for the future. They should kind of stay in the past. <laughs> um, and we shouldn't be limited by that. So one, this, this paper, uh, Baluk Basi, uh, is awesome, it's super satisfying, and I'm really happy to be ending <laughs> with it. Uh, so what you can do is yeah, it's a little bit small, but hopefully you can see uh, those are gendered word pairs like father, mother, king, queen. Um, you can kind of figure out what that pink vector that I drew is uh, through analyzing all the different word pairs, get kind of what's the gender vector um, through uh, princi principal component analysis, if you've heard of that, is the way the paper does it. Um, so then if we draw things with that gender vector kind of up and down. Uh, you can picture that black line as a 49-dimensional plane, or maybe you can't picture that. I can totally picture it, so I don't know what's wrong if you can't. But um, anyway, the insight is like, say, uh, uh, like the word embedding is like words all over this room. Um, everything that's on the floor would be not gendered, and anything that's not would be gendered. So we have here uh, in this diagram, it's showing that words like doctor um, are not in that space that's orthogonal to the gender vector, and hat isn't. <laughs> um, so what you do, uh, step two, is to, to take that gendered vector and then project all of the words that by definition aren't masculine or feminine um, onto that plane. Uh, so then after that, they're like neutral, and it's Pretty awesome. <laughs> uh, and then you can see there's still an issue because they're, uh, let me zoom on this, uh, father and mother are still different distances from that uh, orthogonal space. So you kind of need to move them closer uh, t together or whatever, move them so they're equidistant. Then they're each, it's super satisfying. Each pair of gendered words is equidistant from all of the words that should be neutral, and like the bias is gone. It's like a magic trick, I love it. Um, <laughs> so then, you know, I have like an after, you can type words in there, um, yeah, and then talk a bit about details there too. So play around with that if you like. Um, let's move back to the presentation. Uh, yeah, so uh, just a bit more about what can we do as individuals. Uh, one thing is ho hold the press accountable for how they talk about algorithms. Uh, this is actually a great article. Uh, I didn't see any reporting really about this otherwise. I would recommend reading it, but the title isn't great. They say when an algorithm cuts your healthcare, but it's like people cut your healthcare, uh, and it's dangerous to 
uh, ascribe more agency to algorithms because like it's to they're totally not doing that. It's the people who are deploying them. Um, and you know, technology isn't that well understood among the general population. So if you don't have educated people like ourselves calling people on this, you know, it, it, it's going to be increasingly an increasingly dangerous thing. Um, uh, you can also support tools, standards, and regulation. The GDPR, the lovely thing that was sending us all those privacy emails, it actually has uh, a part of it that's regulating algorithms and, uh, uh, like, uh, yeah, I think sort of interpretability of algorithms. Um, and there's also this uh, group AI Now that's uh, come up with this algorithmic impact assessment. It's like published on their website. Uh, you, it's much like an environmental impact assessment. Um, it's modeled after that, so you know it's basically just doing due diligence on, uh, in a way that they clearly didn't do for those, um, you know, biased and inaccurate <laughs> algorithms uh, that we saw before. Um, and there's a new law in New York uh, that created a task force to push for open source algorithms and ask analysis of racial bias and algorithms and. Uh, it's believed to be the first of its kind, so that's, you know, there, it like just just was signed, I think. So it's a lot of really encouraging stuff, and we should have more of this. Um, and also talk about these issues with your communities, uh, like as technical people, I think we should be leaders in the community around us and help people who have different levels of technical uh, background to understand things as best they can, because um, I think largely things are kind of poorly understood. Um, yeah, and I have a bunch of resources. I'll publish slides later. But uh, on GitHub, there's the uh, that paper they published, uh, you know, their code and debiased versions of these word embeddings. Um, there's uh, ProPublica put their compass analysis on GitHub. They have a fun Jupyter notebook uh, that you can play around with. Um, and there's a deep learning course on Coursera. That's how I heard about this uh, debiasing word embeddings uh, process. Um, it's like pretty far reaching, and I definitely recommend it, especially if you have a strong math background. Uh, but it's also very welcoming and positive and inclusive anyway, I found. Um, yeah, just a ton of organizations, Algorithmic Justice League, AI, AI Now, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And there are whole conferences devoted to fairness um, uh, and those issues. Uh, yeah, um, and then the books I mentioned. Uh, and also, uh, for human bias stuff, there's Project Implicit. I can't recommend that enough. It's super cool to learn about that stuff and learn that you do have biases. Um, some people I follow on Twitter talk about uh, um, criminal justice reform and stuff. And there's Hire More Women in Tech. I like it because it has a bunch of really actionable stuff you can use. But of course, that's just one part of the problem. It's like arguably the most visible because it's the biggest disparity. But there, like, we need more representation across the board, I think. Um, yeah, so thanks so much for your time. I really enjoyed being able to share this with everybody. <laughs>